it's not good enough. It's not good enough to have all of these ideals, promises, power, potential, love, the things that God has provided for us and not have a way to get them. That's not good enough. And uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of what the enemy proposes. It's a pie in the sky idea, but there's no way to get to it. That's the enemy. Everybody say the devil. The devil. That's the devil that creates that picture. Oh, healing. Yeah, not now though. Yeah, blessing, provision, everything that God is. Oh, we just don't know. Well, why did he send the Holy Ghost to lead us and guide us into all truth just so we could come up with the blessed revelation that we don't know? That's not good enough. See? And, uh, you know, if somebody's planning to build a super center, like a Target or a Walmart or maybe some kind of strip mall, could you imagine the kind of oversight where they got all this stuff ready to be consumed, well, but we didn't put any road to get there? Sorry. <laughs> if, if, if people have that enough foresight, don't you think God has enough foresight? Amen? God, the gospel is not a pie in the sky after you die gospel. That's not the gospel. And when Jesus preached the gospel, it was this, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? If it's at hand, you can pick it up. You can hold it. You can see it. And why he had crowds and, and, and throngs of people following him was because the kingdom of heaven was at hand everywhere he went. Amen? So these last couple of weeks, I believe what we're going to do today is going to be some more uh, it's going to be practical. It's going to be application. It's going to be, because we've, we've talked about theory, all right? So you, if you've ever gone to school, you had uh, the theory, but then you had to have practice, right? You had to have the labs. You had to have the, uh, the, the, the actual application. And, and, and quite often, I found, for me, you know, professional students, Anybody else here a professional student? <laughs> if you're a professional student, you love to learn, all right? Well, I love to learn, and I would love to get, like, well, let's just take chemistry, for example, okay? So I took inorganic, organic chemistry, and I love to balance those reactions, equations. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I love that. I got a math brain. I love to, and when it all works out on paper, and it just fits so perfectly, I'm good at that, right? I love that. All contained nice and neat on a piece of paper. Well, then we did lab. And lab's a little bit different animal, isn't it? <laughs> and one of them, one of the labs that I did, we were supposed to. And I, had a, I had to work with a partner in lab, and he, he wanted to uh, take, what was it? It was like apples or apple mash or apple juice, and, and he wanted to ferment it and create alcohol. You know, <laughs> that was... That was one of the approved experiments. And, and <laughs> well, so we went through and we, we tried to follow the book, everything, you know, but we failed miserably. <laughs> we could not. See, what I could do on paper, I could not get it to work in real life. Well, how many, which one's more important? It's real life, right? And, and um, I, you know, it's no good to tell people, you just need to walk in love. Well, I already know that. <laughs> I know I need to walk in love. How do I get to the place where I'm walking in more love? Well, you just need to have faith. Well, what does that mean? You know, you anybody hear messages like that and you just leave, oh, goody, you know? <laughs> but then you're like, oh, you just leave directionless. Just leave. You come out of the door feeling good, but then you're like, I guess nothing's changed. <laughs> and, and that's not what we want. Amen. So these last couple of weeks, we have been talking about, and I think we'll start here. Let's go to Ephesians 5. <clears throat> it's probably been about, I'd have to double check, but I believe it's been five weeks. This is either the fifth week or it has been five weeks that we've been talking about this. We've talked about the unjust judge. We've talked about the abundance of the heart. We've talked about 
David. Okay. And um, well, the unjust judge was a picture, I believe. I don't believe it's talking about God at all. It doesn't fit the rest of the gospel. It doesn't fit the rest of the parables that Jesus gave. So the unjust judge is not God. The unjust judge was about men praying and not fainting is what it says. So the unjust judge, what that's a picture of, and I won't review it, you can listen to the other messages, but in a nutshell, the unjust judge, there's something on the inside of our heart. Everybody pat their heart right here. All right, now I know it's not your physical heart, but it's the core of who you are, okay? You cannot function without the core of who you are. If the core of who you are is double-minded or indecisive, or cannot render a verdict on what is true or what is right or what is wrong or what God is actually like. You know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy to some degree when people preach a gospel that says healing is eliminated. Well, it is eliminated because it's faith that God works with, okay? Now, the truth can be the truth, but God operates with what you believe about him. So there's a judge that's on the inside of you that renders a verdict, and it renders to one side or the other, and this is the way that God has always shown me about who we are. We're three-part being, you know, and, and there's a verse for that. We won't have to go there. But how many of you know your spirit, your soul, and your body, right? So the spiritual part of you, the spiritual part of you was the part of you that was made in the image of God. You know, in the very beginning, Adam was made in the image of God. And what got corrupted or lost was that spirit on the inside, I like to think of it as this way, the nature of it things, you know, like I love last night we watched a nature program with the boys and, and we watched about creatures in the deep. And it's amazing how you watch all those creatures. They somehow know innately on the inside what to do. It, no, nobody taught them. Nobody had to tell them. They just, there is an innate built in nature. Everybody say nature. You know, another good example is that the butterflies I always use. They all fly to the same place, location in Mexico. Somehow they all know how to get there, even though they've never been there before. What is it? I mean, you can't even find their brain. What, what is it that's driving them to get everyone? Have anybody ever seen this on these nature programs? It's, they didn't know about it until 50 years ago. It's called Oaxaca, Mexico, I believe. And they all congregate in this one place, no matter where they're from. How do they know? There's a nature in there. It's the nature of things. It's why dogs bark and cats meow and they don't listen when you talk. You know? it's, it's the nature. Well, see, you were given a nature like God. And that got lost when Adam decided to follow the devil. And it is that that has been redeemed in Christ. Your core, your core, everybody say my core, is made in the image of Christ. See, that is like God now. You, can, you have a like nature like God. He can now, the Holy Ghost can now dwell on the inside of you. He can now reveal things to you because there is a like nature. It's, it's not God things and now human or, or fallen things. It's God to the Spirit of God on the inside of you. Just like dogs teach dog, dog things, and cats teach cat, cat things, and people teach people, people things, all right? So there's that spirit that's on the inside of you, and if you've been born again, it's made like Christ. And then there is the soul, and, and we always, you know, kind of, we do our best to dissect what the soul is. It's, it's your mind, your will, and your emotions, your personality, your character, those, those things, those attributes that are on the inside of you. And the soul is kind of like this go-between, between your body and your spirit. And there is two rivers of input into your soul. There is natural reasonings. There is what I, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna get what I see, what I hear. You know, all these gates, the sense gates. Anybody familiar with that term? Okay. All of these gates of information. And it's necessary. You, they're not evil. They're just misplaced sometimes, okay? You need to have that information. If you're going to drive a car, I'm not going to drive a car in faith. I want my eyes for that, okay? <laughs> all right? You have to, you need those senses to operate in a physical world, all right? But they are not the determining factor of what is truth and what is possible and who God is. And it is, many times it's the enemy that is using what you see and what you hear to convince you of what you believe. 
and there's that judge on the inside of you, it's receiving evidence from the physical through the senses. And that's why we went in great detail about David and how everybody that was afraid, why were they afraid? Because they were founding their ability in what they saw with Goliath. Goliath was a mountain of a man. His, we went over all the weight of the, the armor and everything they received through the physical input their judge on the inside was determining that threat was truth, not God. And David judged in his heart that God had a greater ability, had a greater power, that there was greater strength. If God be with us, who's going to be against us? I'm going to verdict on the side of God. And if he's with me, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, we're not going to, God, you know, what did he, how did David put it? He says, it's not sword and spear and shield that saves. It's God who has the victory. Amen? Well, that's what we've been talking about. So how do you take your heart from one place to another? Maybe you've had a heart where you have judged in fear in the past, in the natural in the past. And, and how do we get our soul, our mind and our will and emotions to recognize the difference between truth and how do we get it to start to judge on the side of, of um, the Spirit of God? Because that Spirit is providing revelation. And, and, and when you spend time praying in the Spirit, it's praying out mysteries regarding who you've been made to be in Christ. It's praying out mysteries regarding your future. And it's trying to, the Holy Ghost is trying to teach you and lead you and guide you. So it's that flow of the Spirit that is supposed to transform, everybody say transform. transform. By the renewing of your mind, that flow of the spirit flows into the soul and starts to transform how you see, how you believe, that when, when, when uh, the devil comes with his presentation, you know, just like a, 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 a lawyer or an attorney comes with their presentation of what is truth, that this is what the devil comes and does. You've got God witnessing by the Spirit of God on the inside of you with His Word, with, with, you know, with the Spirit that's on the inside of you. It says that the Spirit testifies that we are children of God, right? So you have this one lawyer advocating for the truth of God's Word, and then the devil comes, and he has done this from the very beginning. What does he come and say? Hath God said. Hath God said. And this is exactly what happens in a courtroom, isn't it? And who is in the center of it? It's the judge that's in your heart. And by how you judge, you're either loosing life or you're loosing death. You're either uh, sowing to the spirit or you're sowing to the flesh. It's not a rocket science thing. It's a matter of who you're listening to. And it's a matter of who you're giving time to. Uh, you know, this... If you want to know, this is a good, yeah, I've read this, this is, you know, I've heard this taught in Christian circles, it's, it's in the Bible, but you hear it just taught in natural circles as well. If you want a good picture, a good picture of what you're going to look like in five years, look at the people you spend time with. Look at the things you're reading and the things you're watching, the things you're consuming. You can see where you're going. You can see where you're going. It's not rocket science. Who you choose to value in your life. What you choose to value in your life. Okay? It does, it's not haphazard. You're going to go one way or going to go to another way. Everybody in Ephesians 5? All right. Ephesians 5. <clears throat> we'll start in verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, and that just means carefully or diligently, on purpose. Everybody say, on, pur on purpose. On purpose. <laughs> See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And he gives this parable. It's such a short parable, but that's what it is. And be not drunk with wine... Wherein is excess, but it's okay to be filled with the Spirit, okay? And I'll just run down this for, for just, repetition is a good way to learn, amen? <laughs> All right, so what happens when somebody is drunk? That substance, that natural substance, has a physical effect 
on their senses. It has effect on how they perceive the natural world. It has an effect on how they see things. Okay. Well, Paul is drawing a parallel. He's saying, look, don't be drunk. Okay. Don't be drunk. Don't let anything rule you. But if you're going to let something rule you, if you're going to be drunk, be filled with the Spirit. Okay. How do you do that? Well, he gives you an insight right here. Verse 19, speaking to yourselves. Everybody say yourselves. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody where? In your heart. Now, I took, I took great time, I think it was maybe a week or two ago, about the difference between your heart and your mind. All right? Your mind is not made for believing. Your mind is made for knowing. Your mind is made for, you know, it's like the calculator. There's no heart in a calculator, but it's accurate. <laughs> Your brain is made to take the input from the outside and calculate and come up with a solution. All right? But your mind is not made for heart believing. It's with the heart man believes, Paul said, right? In Romans 10, with the heart man believes, not with the mind. But the mind does have to be transformed. Otherwise, the mind is going to step in at the gate and say, no, we're not letting that go. Anybody have their mind get in their way? Yeah. Trip you up? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul creates this parable or this, this, um, this example in the same way that a drunkard has an effect or uh, alcohol has an effect on their senses. When you spend time in the spirit in worship, it puts your mind, everybody say my mind. It puts your mind in a place of saturation of the reality of the kingdom of God. And Paul's not writing this just as a theory. He practiced it. Everybody say practiced. I mean, if you want a good example, okay, let's, I'm just going to go there because I was just going to talk about it, but let's go there. I've got to look it up though. <laughs> let's go to the book of Acts. Yes, let's go to chapter 16. I'm just going to give a little backstory on this because this will be good. Now, in this, in this certain situation, Paul had just basically set free that demon-possessed girl that was prophesying and that you know, it was that oracle that kind of made this guy money that she would, she would prophesy, and, and, and it was a devil, okay? And Paul commanded that thing to come out and freed the girl. Praise God, right? <laughs> okay, so here's, here's what happens when you follow God. <laughs> verse, okay, so everybody in Acts 16, verse 19. And when her masters, the masters of this girl, when her masters saw that the hope of their gains... Their money was gone. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Well, that turned quickly. <laughs> Here we are. Following God, and if you have any, how many, I'm just going to put it this way. You need the kind of equipment of praise and worship, and you need the kind of equipment that's in your heart to be able to handle some of these situations that'll come when revival is at your doorstep. Because if you are actively, aggressively taking ground, is it not a battle? If you're taking ground from the devil, do you think the devil's just going to sit on his hands? 
he's going to get people riled up. He's going to get people upset. He's going to send them after you, and they're going to throw you in prison, whatever they can do, and there better be something on the inside of you that can handle it, that is drunk enough in the spirit to be able to fight back. Amen? And that's what David did in the physical all right, that's what he did in the physical. But it says, Paul says, we do not fight with flesh and blood, right? We're not fighting with flesh and blood anymore. We're fighting against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. And you go challenging their ground, and believe me, they think it's their ground. They're going to fight back with you. And they're going to come in the form of lawyers, and they're going to come in the form of uh, uh, they're going to come in the form of senators. They're going to come in the form of protesters with signs. And they're going to say stuff. And what's going to be on the inside of you better be bigger than the devil you're facing. Amen? This is, this is where, yeah, we want revival, but we also want to be prepared for revival. Right? We don't want it to be a flash in a pan. <clears throat> in verse 22, And the multitudes rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Good job following God. This is what you get. <laughs> And when they had laid many, everybody say many, many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Now, I don't know, I don't think we got enough time to do all this justice, okay? But if you could just put yourself in their situation, you've seen a tremendous miracle and you set a girl free. Now you've gone to jail. You've been beaten. The whole town's mad at you. What's going to happen on the inside? Anybody? <laughs> you, so you, you having a rough day? What's on the inside better be bigger than what's on the outside. We better have those scales tipped in the favor of our heart. We had better have those scales tipped in the favor of God before us who's going to be against us. I don't care what I see. I don't care what I feel. I care that God is here in this cell with me. Amen? And look at this. You know, when he gives this instruction in Ephesians 5 and says, speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, he's not preaching theory like this is a nice spiritual, you know, idea. Let's just sing. This is what he went to war with when he had been imprisoned, beaten, and was ready to, you know. This was the end, apparently. Now look at this. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. Everybody say, sang praises. Amen. Unto God. And now look at this. It says, and the prisoners heard them. Now what does that tell me? They weren't keeping it to themselves. They weren't, praise you, Father. <laughs> praise you, Father. Worship you. There's, time, there's times for that. There's nothing wrong with that. But you know, they were shouting at the top of their lungs. They were screaming and yelling, and they were giving glory to God, so much so that everybody in that jail could hear them. That's faith. You want to talk about not fainting and having faith and praying? That judge, what they were doing is exactly what he was teaching the Ephesians to do. They were getting drunk in the spirit and their spirit and their heart and their soul and their mind were all in agreement. God's word is truth and I could care less. I, don't, I forget who, what it is. If it's I could care not less or I could care less. But I could, it's, oh, that's it. It's I could not care less. Yes, I got it. I could not care less. I've been working on that one, okay? <laughs> I could not care less about the stripes. I could not care less about the angry mob that, that talked mean to me. I could, care, I could not care less about the death sentence and the imprisonment. There's no way getting out. We're in the inner prison. Praise God. In the face of impossible, when you praise and worship, there is a strengthening and a bolstering of your spirit that it doesn't matter what you see or what you feel, God is with you and there's faith that God can use to manifest deliverance. Amen? And he does. And suddenly, everybody say suddenly. 
There was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loose. Now I could keep reading, but that's some, most, some of that's a different message. But you get the principle. He didn't, he didn't just, I guarantee you, he had a lifestyle of worship before this happened. He did not live by his feelings every day and then get cast into the innermost prison and then decide to worship. I guarantee you he did not. He was living that all the time. That's why it, the, the devil could not stop him. And there are so many par parallels in the Old Testament where they would go to war, whether it was Jehoshaphat or Joshua. Didn't they sound the trumpets and give a shout of praise and the walls came down? I mean, there's so many parallels where the worshipers went to war. And it's not just a natural example. It is supposed to be displaying a spiritual principle that when you spend time in worship and in praise, it is giving your heart a jump on the reality of God's truth. Amen. This is something that we can apply in our daily lives, and I guarantee you Paul did before he got in prison. That's why God could send him to these places. Amen. All right, let's go to, yeah, let's go to Genesis chapter 13. How many of you know Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says by um, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now if you were to switch that around and give the converse of it, you could say the converse of that statement is without hope. If I say without hope. Without hope, there is nothing that faith can give substance to, all right? Now, in, in a lot of uh, charismatic circles, we often emphasize faith, but hope is required for faith to work. Without hope, there is nothing that faith can give substance to, all right? This goes hand in hand. This is married together what produces, what God works with is faith. And through faith, God is able to release his strength and his ability in situations. But faith without hope is like the body without the spirit. Okay? Faith works by hope. There is this go-between, and why I was talking about the spirit, the soul, and the body at the beginning, is there is a spiritual part of you that is like God, but there's some kind of overlap with who you really, with who you are in your soul, where your emotions and your mind and everything that you do has an impact on what you, what you become. So that when, even if you don't necessarily feel like it in your body or in your situation or your circumstances, you, in, you make a choice to worship God, it has an impact on your emotions and it has an impact on your hope. It has an impact on your mind. It gives you, I don't want to sound humanistic, but it, it makes it positive. You are focusing on who God is, not on the situation. You're focusing on his power, on his ability, on his provision in the midst of an attack of the enemy. And when you do that, it brings hope. Hope. You cannot have mountain-moving faith and not have hope on the inside of you. So what does hope look like? Without faith, there's, okay. Without hope, there's nothing for faith to give substance to. So let's go to, everybody in Genesis 13? Did I say 15? Uh, let's go to 13. I have both of them down, but Genesis 13. We'll start there. Everybody knows that 
you know, Gen- or, um, Abraham was given a promise. Everybody say promise. Abraham was given a promise by God that he would be the father of a multitude. And wouldn't it be like God to give somebody a promise? <laughs> You're going to be the father of a multitude, but you can't have a baby in your own ability. That just sounds just like God. <laughs> right? Well, look at what God does. And you can say, well, God just decided to give them a baby. But why would he need to do all this? God cannot just jump in and just switch things. Just because. He needs you. Everybody say me. He needs you. See, why would God give him this vision? Look at this. We're going to read um, Genesis 13. We'll start here in verse 14. Genesis 13, 14. <clears throat> And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Now, why is God telling him this? What's the point? What is the purpose? See, I can imagine. I've never been to a desert. I've never seen all that sand. But I've seen videos of it. And could you imagine you grab a handful of that infinite amount and you try and start counting? You start counting. Three hours later, I got the first handful done. <laughs> there was 12, 1,293 grains of sand in that first handful. You know, and you're standing on one dune, and you can see about 12 dunes, and you, you can't see the end of it. What is God doing? He is imparting a picture of hope. He is giving a picture of hope to Abraham. See, and this is that judge that's on the inside. Because all his life, he has tried to have a child. And he has failed. And there's all that evidence. Everybody say evidence. There's all that evidence in the natural that says this is impossible. This is not going to happen. And God gives him a different picture. He doesn't... I mean, in, in our terms, you know, you come home and you look at that empty crib that you've had set up for decades. And you say, where's that promise that God said? And it continues to nag at you and it continues to taunt you. And that's what the enemy does, hath God said. And God is giving him a different picture. You imagine all that stand. Take a picture of it sometime. Go look. He says, try and number it. That's how your seed's going to be. Complete opposite end of the spectrum. Life instead of death. Multiply instead of nothing. Right? It's a completely different picture. Well, that's in the daytime. So in the daytime, you can go out and look. You can go out and look and you can see all the sand in the daytime and you say, I can't, there's no way I can number this. That's a powerful picture. Okay, well, let's go to 15. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, we'll start reading here in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, To me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my own house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. Everybody say heaven. Look now towards heaven. And tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. 
And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. So this first vision was in the daytime. Number the, number the grains of sand. I can't. At the nighttime, he'd look up and he'd see the stars. And, I, you know, we have so much modern lighting and everything. If you're around city, you can't see him. But out there in the desert, when it's, when it's cold or it's crisp or it's clear, and, you, you know, anybody ever seen one of those pictures of the Milky Way where it's not even discernible dots, it's just a fog of stars? Try and number all those. What was God doing? He was imparting hope. He was giving him a different vision and not just a different vision, but it didn't matter what time of day it was. He would be outside walking in the sand and he'd look and he remembered God's promise. It could be nighttime and he'd look up the stars and he'd remember God's promise. 24 hours a day, there was a witness that what God said was true and what that hope was designed to do was to give him a vision on the inside that would counteract the evidence that he had been receiving all his life that he was saying to God right now, I don't have a child. And God was looking for faith. He was looking for his heart to believe. Everybody say believe. Amen. And, what, and we all know what happened, right? He, he received that child. But God on purpose gave him a vision of hope. It was hope. And faith with hope works. But faith without hope doesn't fill. It's like maybe you have water. All right. The water is the faith. But hope is the container. If you don't, water is going to fill whatever that container is. See, but if there isn't a, if this container isn't solid, if it isn't crystal clear in your heart, faith isn't going to fill it and, subs and give it substance. Does that make sense? <clears throat> As we were reading these two, I had a verse. I felt it. Let's end with this verse. Everybody go to Psalms 1. We're not going to end with this verse, but this was the capstone to that picture. <laughs> okay. I got too much to say to be done. <laughs> Psalms 1. In his own way, before this was written, before the new covenant, or before the, uh, the Ten Commandments and the, the covenant that was struck with Moses, in the same way, this, this is what God was doing with Abraham. This is what, this is what uh, David writes here in Psalms 1. Look at this. Psalms 1, 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And in his own way, Abraham was receiving a vision, day and night meditation, the sand beneath his feet and the stars above his head. It was day and night giving a testimony. It was day and night ringing in his mind, this is God's promise to you. This is God's promise to you. This is God's promise to you. And it produced faith. And eventually there was faith enough on the inside. In, I believe it's Romans, it says that he was fully persuaded. Everybody say fully persuaded fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. Fully persuaded. And that persuasion comes on that judge when you give yourself to the vision of hope that the word of God provides. All right. Everybody getting this? I'm, I'm just so excited about this. Praise God. <clears throat> All right. So how do we apply this? We've taught confession here a number of times, how to confess the word, all right? Confession is more than just repeating. Confession is not just about saying things. All right. <laughs> um, I remember when I was 12, 13, I'm in that gray area where I'm getting a little too old to spank, right? But you still need to discipline the kids. So when you get in that area, what my dad had me do when I was doing something wrong 
was I had to ride out sometimes 50, times, sometimes 100. I forgot about this till the other day. Sometimes I'd have to ride out 500 times. Richard will not talk back to mom. <laughs> Richard will over and over and over and over and over. So me being the efficient little, you know, uh, Ford, Henry Ford kind of guy that I was, I created an assembly line with these. <laughs> so I did not write it out like that. I wrote Richard, 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 Richard. I broke it down. Will, 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 will. Because it was easier to repeat one word. You got faster as you went, you know. <laughs> you had to write the whole thing. It took forever. So I, now I'm giving all these bad ideas to some of you kids. I'm sorry if this is <laughs> But he didn't know, so I would do columns. Richard, 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 Richard. I didn't, I didn't want the lesson. I wanted to get it over with. <laughs> well, sometimes that's how we... I, I've treated confession that way. Anybody else treated confession that way? Oh, yeah, we got to confess our words, you know, like, so we can get on and watch Netflix. <laughs> we got to confess and get it out of the way so we can do something else. You can do it that way, and there's, you're going to have some benefit, but it's not going to be the kind of benefit that God wants. Okay? The kind of benefit that God's trying to impart is more than just the exercise of saying something you don't mean, just to get it out of the way. That's not confession. That's not powerful confession anyway. I believe God can use that to change your heart over time. But what would be better than that? What would be better than that? Rather than just mindless confession, having your mind wander to something else, having your mind think about X, Y, Z thing, solving a problem while you're saying something. You know, and the same thing sometimes happens when you read the Bible, right? You read the Bible for about 20 minutes, And you figure out five minutes ago, you stopped reading, really. You still read, but you're thinking about somebody else or something else, right? So what I do to train my soul to pay attention, what's the last thing I actively remember? Sometimes it's a chapter back. We start start over, right? Start over, read it again, because your soul doesn't get to decide what you're thinking about, right? I don't care if you're bored. We're going to get this. And eventually, you just get so frustrated, you pay attention. (laughs) So, when you're doing your confession, or if you have confessions, and I I believe you should. If you don't, you should, okay? Now, confessions are specific to the Word of God. If there's promises that God has in His Word, then you need to find verses in context, okay? Not out of context, in context, (laughs) that apply to your situation and use it as evidence for your soul that what God says can come to pass. Maybe it's healing. Find all of those verses. I love the verses where, Je- where it says, and Jesus healed them all. Doesn't give any kind of, it doesn't give any kind of exclusions, you know, except for that guy, one guy that God was trying to teach something, except for this one guy who wasn't the right timing. It doesn't say anything. It just says he healed them all. And when I get a picture like that in my soul, of thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming with anything, any kind of person. They were sinners. They were prostitutes. It didn't matter. He healed them all. And if God is God, this is what he said, if God is God to everybody, if the sun shines on the wicked, the just and the unjust, and the rain comes on the just and the unjust, God loves both. And that's who God was through Jesus to everybody, whether they believed on him or not. So if God's willing to do that, He's going to heal me. And you create this picture and a confession coming out your mouth, and you start to believe in your heart what it says in the word, right? But if you just say, by, how many of us have said, by his stripes I'm healed? I'm not even thinking about that anymore. By his stripes I'm healed. There has to come a picture of hope. Everybody say hope. See, maybe it's specific to you. Maybe you've, you're not able to do something that you used to be able to do. You need to, as you're confessing the word, add a tagline in there that says, God gives me strength to do X, Y, Z thing. And as you're saying it, see in your heart walking or doing, or maybe it's skiing or playing basketball. I have strength in my body to be able to do that and see yourself doing that. Give a vision to your faith. Amen? See, and when David did this, what David was not vague about what he was going to do to Goliath. We read it, right? 
He says, I'm going to take the head off your shoulders. <laughs> he was specific. And what he said exactly came to pass. See, now we don't fight with flesh and blood like they did in the Old Testament. We fight against principalities and powers. Amen. So there is a picture that he's wanting to paint on the inside of you. And that picture that he paints on the inside of you is forming and it's what provides substance for the faith. It provides the container for the faith. But if there is nothing solid in your heart, if there's no clear picture, faith can't flow into a vague reality. It's not going to fit. All right. But this power, this verse in Psalms where it says in this law doth he meditate day and night. And just like Abraham, he had that meditation going in his heart. The sand beneath his feet and the stars above his head. There was a day and night meditation on the truth of the promise of the word of God. Amen. All right. So as you're confessing, as you're writing up whatever it is, the first step is to add hope. Okay. This is a recipe. Okay. We're, we're writing a recipe. Get the truth. That's the first step. You can't have a lie and then add hope to it and expect God to pour into it, <laughs> right? One, you want to have the truth. Then you need to add hope, and hope is in your heart, all right? Faith will work with hope. And when you have hope of the thing that God has promised you in there, it's going to be able to pour into it. But there's another element to this that goes beyond just hope there's a reason why he didn't just say confess to yourselves he said Paul said to sing he said to speak to your heart in psalms and hymns and songs right what is it I mean everybody loves music right doesn't it it moves you doesn't it music is designed to move you even music that's bad music what I the devil knows this principle okay I want to I want to hit this for a second if you hear some of the, hmm, the devil will preach his gospel with music, and it's powerful music. Some of the, the most beautiful, written, moving songs I disagree with. I love the song. It makes me wish I believed it. That's how the devil preaches. And I've, I've listened to now, we'll be sitting in the car, and every once in a while, we'll flip it around and see what the world's saying, right? And, <laughs> and then we were listening. I don't even remember the artist, but there was this one guy, and he was putting into words. It was a beautiful song, but he was preaching the world, preaching sin, preaching change, but it's not the kind of change you want, not if you're following God. But it was so beautifully written. It was this kind of beautiful ballad, and I... Your soul is like, man, I wished I agreed with that. Now, that is the power and the strength in music. And MTV and, and, and pinnacles of culture, they are, whether you think of it or not, they are masters of evangelism with music. Not necessarily for the sake of an artist, but for the sake of a mindset. For the sake of indoctrinating a culture for the sake of turning many, many minds to their cause. And what would be the power and the strength of the word of God if you would use music that way in your own life? Right? I mean, you ever been to a concert? Let's leave God out of it. Been to a concert and you just get so moved and wrapped up in it. But for what? There's no, it there doesn't go anywhere, but it's beautiful, Right? See, you apply that kind of moving in your soul and the kind of hope in your soul. When you have those ingredients that you know the truth and there is a hope in your heart and your emotions are raptured by the truth because you're giving praise and worship about what's possible, something is going to switch and there's going to be earthquakes and there's going to be changes and there's, and there's going to be God flowing in your circumstances like he flowed through Paul, like he flowed through David, like he flowed through Jesus. But it comes with a clear vision of hope. Amen. <clears throat> I want to read one excerpt of a document. 
I didn't write it, but we'll end with this. Um, and uh, this is a, a preacher that has blessed me uh, since I was 18. And um, I've always thought very highly of him. And uh, this guy's name is Gary Carpenter. And if you want more resources from him, they're all free. Uh, GaryCarpenter.org. But I wanted to read this little excerpt from, it's called Face to Face with and it's just, that's short for face-to-face with God, okay? But this particular article is called The God of Hope. And I'll just give you, you know, we practice here. We, we preach sitting and listening and having the Holy Ghost teach us. It's amazing. It happens, right? So when he preaches to you, you write down what he preaches, And so what Gary did by the instruction of the Holy Spirit is write down the things that the Holy Spirit was telling him. It's not comprehensive, but it is written document form of his quiet time with God. And there are lessons that he gave to to Gary, and I have read all of them. I love them all, but this one in particular is called The God of Hope, and it is written as though the Holy Spirit is speaking to Gary. Okay? So this is what is written. It's called The God of Hope. Faith in what? Faith in what? Many crisscross the land and teach with great swelling words the mechanics of faith. Even though these prescriptions of faith are accurate, yet when the people try to employ them, many fail. For the truth of the matter is this. They have no real hope on the inside of them. The image is not real in them. Hope is not real in them. They still think not that their lives can change. They have no vision of overcoming. They have no vision of being blessed. They still believe in their heart because of lack of hope that what has been is what shall be. Again, I say, without hope, there is nothing for faith to give substance to. Faith in what? Faith in what? Their faith must be in the hope given by the God of hope through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Son, hear my voice. To help the people, they must have hope. They must have a living hope, a lively hope, a hope that cannot be quenched. Doesn't that sound like Paul and Silas sitting there? Cannot. Everybody say cannot a hope that cannot be quenched, a hope that cannot be stolen. They must have the image on the inside that is more real (laughs) than all the circumstances they face daily. And when I I didn't plan that, but I just heard that, that same thing that God told me years ago when I had that headache. You remember that? When I had that headache, he told me the reality that I healed you is not greater than the reality of your pain. See? I'm going to read that last little sentence again. I'm just going to read this part. It's longer than this. But they must have the image on the inside that is more real than all the circumstances they face daily. (laughs) Okay. And uh, (laughs) this is my little example I always use. When I was younger, I was about... We still lived on Marion Street, so I had to have been about 9 or 10. And it was Christmas morning. Everybody loves Christmas morning, especially as a kid, right? You remember that feeling? I mean, I still feel that way. <laughs> right? What did Natalie get me this Christmas? It's going to be good. I know it is. Right? <laughs> but, um, and I, I had a dream that night before Christmas. I had a dream that I got one of those Daisy Pump Action BB guns. I had it. It was so real. I swear it happened. I know it did. It's all, maybe in a, a different reality somewhere. I know it happened. Because I felt it. I came down the stairs. I got under the tree. I ripped it open, and there it was. And to have a BB gun in town. Because <laughs> we live in the center of town, you know. <laughs> what are you going to do with a BB gun except shoot the semis going to Monfort, you know? <laughs> But I knew it was there, and it was so alive. Everybody say alive. It was so alive in me. I knew when I got up 
and went down there. So when I woke up, I thought, oh, did that happen already? What? I ran down there and I looked and I didn't get a BB gun. <laughs> but my point is, it was so real on the inside. I was convinced. I was convinced. Now, that particular, I don't have that. I'm, I'm not saying that that happened every year. That was unique. I had a dream and I knew it. It was so part of you, you know. And God wants to give you a vision. Maybe it's your calling that you don't think is ever going to come to pass. Maybe it's, it's healing. The bottom line is God is God. And if you believe in who he is, it doesn't matter what you're believing for. If you're trusting in who he is to you, there's going to be hope there. Amen? If you can fill your heart with a specific image of hope, it's going to change your life. And if you spend time in rapturing your emotions and your soul in worship, it's going to produce faith. And the more time you do that, there's going to come a tipping point. There's going to come a moment in your heart where you step across that line or that threshold and the judge is going to render a verdict. God's word is true. What you say is going to come to pass. Amen? Spend time, not just mindless confessing, Spend time singing in your own heart, making melody in your heart. Spend time giving yourself an image of hope. See what has not been. Because if you, if you only fill your heart with what has been, it's just going to reproduce over and over and over. Maybe it's habitual sin. Maybe it's habitual sin. Do you know it's not by your works that you're free? It's by the cross that you're free? If you continue to meditate upon the failure of your habits instead of replacing that image with hope that I can be free, you're going to reproduce that. And maybe you think it's a good idea to beat yourself up every time you make a mistake, but all you're doing is reinforcing an image of hopelessness you're never going to change. It doesn't matter what it is. What does God say about you needs to be in your heart. Amen. It will produce hope. And it will bring you to a place where you're drunk in the spirit. And when you have that place, it's going to move those mountains. It's going to shake the chains. It's going to break down the barriers. It's going to, the walls of Jericho are going to come down and everything. All those pictures, it's a spiritual principle. And it's yours. Everybody say, it's mine. mine. Let's say this together before we go. Father God, I thank you for your truth. I'm not content with an image of hopelessness, of faithlessness, of despair. What has been is not what shall be. I am going to change what's in my heart and faith is going to give substance to the hope that I have in the truth. And that's it. That's it. If you, and don't be mamby-pamby about it. You you know if you believe yourself, right? Don't whisper. Let's shout it. Amen? Let's get excited about it. It's not dead. It's not quiet. It's alive and it's real and it's ready for you. And it has been since God sent Christ. It's ready for you now. Amen? All right. Well, Father, I thank you that you fix this message to fit every single person where they are yes and i thank you father yeah i thank you father that you give them a hope project specific to each and every one of them don't don't let the enemy dilute your focus to take on the whole world at once i thank you holy spirit that you bring to every receptive heart one thing One thing that they are to practice building an image of hope to and to be drunk in the spirit about that one thing so that they can receive and believe and understand the principles that have been preached. Give each and every one that hope project and I believe and I stand in agreement that what you said will come to pass in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is not the theory. This is not book work. This is lab, all right? And it's not going to be lab unless you go home and do something with it. Amen?
So take some time. Get before the Lord. Hear what kind of thing he would have for you to focus in on. And let him show you how this works. Because it works. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you guys. You are dismissed.